Here is your Radio Theater Channel weekly podcast for download. The RTC still has the very best old-time radio on the live streaming. And if it's music you love, tune in to the RTC Music Channel, where this link and many others are on our website at oldtimeradiolisten.com. Now, here's Jim. This week we'll start off in New York City with Danny Clover and an episode of Broadway Is My Beat, the Janice Bennett murder case from 1953. Broadway's My Beat, the Times Square to Columbus Circle, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway's My Beat, transcribed with Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Swift flood of nighttime into the neon alley. And Broadway bites its lip, makes the plunge, leaps into cross currents of night. And the gutters flow with a scarlet liquid of light and specklings of gold has fallen from the fountains of spectaculars. The fast walk, then, is what is called for. The rush to buy the first dream in the movie palace, to be up front and close when the hawkers simper, to be first in line in the basement dance pavilion. And there's time to make a choice where the dance will be close and warmth will glisten on a girl's mouth. Where warmth is and swift flood of night. Hurry, hurry, hurry. And from somewhere out in search of darkness, the phone called to headquarters and taken by Detective Mugovan. Yeah. Yeah, I heard. Yeah, I understood. Now listen to me a minute. Now just listen, will you? I want you to talk to Lieutenant Clover. Yeah, he's the man you want. He handles things like this. You hold on, huh? Yeah. Yeah, he's right here. Danny? What? The man on the phone says he knows where there's a dead woman. He's screaming with it. You take it, huh? I'll try to trace it. Yeah. Hello? Hello? I told the other man. Why did well, he... Well, just tell me too, huh? This is Lieutenant Clover. He's uh... dead! Who is? You go there. You go where I tell you. You'll see. All right. Give me the address. Hello. Hello. Marley Apartments on West 39th. Fifth floor apartment. Do you hear me? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Marley Apartments, West 39th. Fifth. Fifth floor. Apartment 5C. You got that? Yeah. Who is this? Don't you care who this is. You just go where I told you. You see, I'm not lying. Well, we'll check. Just tell me who you are. We'll need to... She's dead. Killed until she was dead. That's all you need. Someone I love! Someone! Someone I love! You trace it, Mugman? Yeah, yeah, I just did, Danny. Pay station, subway platform, 34th Street. Eight million people ride the subway, Danny. Most of them with diamonds. Yeah, come on. Five C. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there. Dead? Dead, huh? Yeah, face bruised like that. Arms. Let's take a look around. You do. Wait a minute. Okay, mister. Come on in. Close the door, Mugman. Who are you, mister? Who? She's dead, isn't she? Of course she is. Your doctor? That bag? Get out of the way. There's a ritual of stethoscope to search for heartbeat. Search. Heartbeat. And also ritual of the pulse, professional manner of looking vague and wise while holding the wrist. And this too, shaking the head briefly, small sigh, and the pronouncement. Dead. You look real professional, Doc. Now which Doc The one I... who's her father. Sorry. A little reversal now, gentlemen. By reason of my status. My daughter's dead at our feet. Therefore, it gives me the right to ask you who you are and what... Police. I'm Lieutenant Clover. This is Detective Mugovan. No, doctor. I'm Dr. Nolan. John Nolan. This girl... This... This once daughter of mine... Now, this take it easy. Girl. Mugovan, <laughs> yeah. Hello? What? Danny, the same guy who phoned... <clears throat> what? Hey, murderer! Hey, give me the phone, Doc. Hey, give me the phone. Hello, my... Murderer. Yes. Yes, yes, she's dead. Of course you may. Here, he wants to talk to you. Hello? Hello, who is this? Hello? Hello? He hung up. Okay, Doc, did you recognize the voice? My daughter's murderer. Yes? His name. That's right. Just a favor I ask you, that's all. What about the man's name? Then a bargain. First you let me make a phone call. 
first, you let me make a phone call. All right. John Nolan, Emery. Listen, I want you to know Janice is dead. Yes. Thank you, gentlemen. It was good of you. Hey, listen, Doc. Why don't you just sit down and let's have a chat? Would you mind if we went out in the hall of the kitchen? Out in the hall will be okay. Mike, call the ambulance technical. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The man I just spoke to... The one you called? Yes, his name is Emery Fulsom. You'd ask me about all this, so I thought... Go on. His name is Emery Fulsom, an old friend, a dear friend. And the man who called? My son-in-law. I see. My son-in-law, husband to my daughter, killer You're of... sure he killed your daughter? Find him. He'll tell you exactly that he did. All right. What does he look like? He's... Wait. Uh, I want to get it down. All right. Name, Lou Bennett. Address, why, right here. Why, exactly here where he killed my daughter. 28 years of age, very close to 5 feet, 10 inches tall, brown hair, gray eyes. Distinguishing marks, none that I know. Apparel? Apparel. A young man who affects tweeds. Tweeds and a pipe. Please find him. Listen, you've got to find him. What about Emery Folsom? Surely there's... What about him? The one to whom you run when there is trouble. When there is death. And he knew your daughter well? Yes. I want to talk to him. You'll find him at the Smallwood. But listen... Lou Bennett. Get him. Yeah. Bogwin? Amateur will be here. Call on this end. All points bulletin. Right. Lou Bennett, huh? That... Uh huh. Her husband. Close to river, reflecting light flung off barge, off freighter, the gleaming marble facade of the Smallwood Apartments. The place of Emery Fulsom gleams also with fall of soft light. On deep hue of oil painting which is a life-size portrait of the man who has opened the door to you and permitted you... A glimpse, dear fellow. A glimpse of warmth. And then you too must go. And permitted you this... A phrase of music. An immortal phrase. Which you may take with you when you go and with which you may while away a lonely hour. Maybe you didn't hear, Mr. Folsom. I'm from the police. Teasing will get you but nowhere. And I've just come from a place where a woman is dead. The place where Janice is dead? Janice Bennett, yes. The place from which a father phoned me and said a daughter was dead. Yes. And you were there while he so gave me the tidings. Yes. And you forced a bereaved father to tell you to whom he had turned for solace in his desolate night. That's right. Now, may I come in? But you must. You definitely must. Sit there. Sit there on that chaise where once a maiden of Louis XVI's court dangled a foot and had it washed and kissed. Sit there. All right. And thus the light falls on your face. Interestingly. Most interestingly. There's a chair at police headquarters, Mr. Folsom, where a maiden once sat, dangled a toll. Maybe you'd like... To... <laughs> precious, most precious. You want to know, of course, why John Nolan phoned me of his daughter's death, me of all the souls in the world. Yeah, I do. Well, this will regale you. John and I were children together. He was the son of my father's gardener, I the son of my father, who was monstrous, rich, had mansions in all the watering places. We played in my father's gardens, Johnny Boy and I, when we grew to manhood, as you have noted, and my father subsidized Johnny through medical school, and I, in turn, have carried on my father's tradition. Oh? I, too, subsidize, I... Then your friendship with John Nolan and his daughter... You interrupted. Sorry. I, too, subsidize things... Among which was the marriage of Janice to a penniless boy. Lou Bennett. Lou Bennett, penniless boy. Callow and a bumpkin, but not without charm. And I said to Janice, you want this, you shall have it. And I paid the tab for a brilliant wedding. And I said to Janice, I said... I'll ask what I said to the lovely daughter of my doctor friend. All right, what? I said, Janice, no need to tell your youth that you're a child of lowly income. No need to tell your youth I have paid for your wedding... For youth is blunt, and youth is uncivilized. And the youth you wed, Janice, may take umbrage at my gift. Tell him your father paid. It's what I said to lovely Janice, who was not then a trifle dead. By whose hand dead, may I ask? Her husband called us, told us she was dead. We're looking for him. Her father says... That Lou murdered Janice. 
but then a father must know. And you, what do you think? That youth is blunt, that youth is uncivilized, and that killing is in the hands of youth. And leave the elegant man. Leave him. And out into the world now where the perfumes are not of sandalwood, nor the areas cubicled by damask drape, nor drenched with music. Into the world, and the corner of it rented to make room for stove, sink, and bed. So sleep away seven hours. Until the mechanism says stop sleeping. Make the adjustment to it. Get up. Coffee. And the world again. Headquarters. And the mechanism again. Large. More expensive. But cousin to your very own alarm clock. Clock on the wall at police headquarters. Its fingers move just as the poet said they would. And cause this to happen. No report yet on the whereabouts of Lou Bennett, Danny. And move. And cause this to happen. Nothing's turned up on that all-points bulletin yet, Danny Lou Bennett. Cause this to happen. Danny Clover speaking. I'm calling from the Thomas Hotel on 3rd Avenue, mister. Who is this? Myron Gannaway. I'm the manager here. Man hung himself in one of my rooms. You better come on down. There he is. I didn't cut him down on the con I didn't want to touch. Yeah, I know how you boys like to do all the touching. Listen, master, I've been running flea bags since... Uh, look, there's his wallet on the table. Untouched, too, mister. How come they pick flea bags to do things like... He signed the register Lou Bennett. Is that what his name is in his wallet? Lou Bennett? Yeah, I can see from here. That's what it says. Lou Bennett. You are listening to Broadway's My Beat, written by Morton Fine and David Friedkin, and starring Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover. Beginning next Friday at this time, CBS Radio brings you the exciting assignments of Big City Police in the 21st Precinct. Formerly Tuesday evenings, the 21st Precinct dramatizes day-to-day, hour-to-hour activities of men who constantly court danger and death in the line of duty. Remember, starting at this time next Friday, the 21st Precinct on most of these same stations. The light that curtains Broadway in late November is a thing of gauze, gray stuff that touches autumn to December. It's the time when the shadows come in with the sun, the time of the three coffee breakfast, of the sweater and vest under the coat. And the chill moon hangs around till late morning, then scuds away with a cloud. And in the shop windows, the plucked bird hangs high over stalks of corn and pumpkin pie and plaster pilgrims. And next window, girl in tweeds and lad in monogrammed cashmere walk hand in hand down life's highway. Small heartbreak time, autumn's dying, a year's drifting away. And where I was, hotel on 3rd Avenue, a place of drift and a thousand small dyings, the price being a dollar and a half a night which included Mr. Ganaway. Hey, you boys clean up pretty included... fast, don't you? Come in, size up a situation, call your buddies, one of whom happens to carry a knife for cutting down purposes. And... While I hand it to you, Clover, this room's not looking All so... All right, good. Mr. Ganaway, how come? A fellow's got a problem, a fellow's got a belt, so he uses the belt to solve the problem, hung himself. Hey, you're quite an authority on things like this, aren't you, Mr. Ganaway? I had a piece done on me for the newspapers, Clover, six years ago. Listen, you run a hotel, life in the raw, flows we'll in We'll get back out. to Lou Bennett, huh? You want me to say a thing I already said again? About the belt and the problem again? Anything unusual You've got to be more specific on that, Clover. Uh, let me tell you something. Mm-hmm. I've been questioned by cops before, Clover. Never nibble at general questions. Wait them out. Bennett have any visitors? Miss Toby Douglas, who resides at 1212 Central Park West, apartment F7. This lady called at 7.20 p.m. You see, all you got to do is ask me specific. How do you know all this, Mr. Kenway? Show you. Miss Douglas' card. Mm-hmm. She rang the desk bell, and when I came out of my room, she handed it to me. See? At the time written on it and everything. Message. Dear boy, when you get sober and need me, call me again. Toby. Hey, go on, turn it over. A name? Address. First time I was ever handed a card. Got another question? Did you see Miss Douglas come up to his room? No, no. She came down. She rang me on the desk bell. She could have gone out. I wouldn't have noticed either, except she rung me out of my room. Well? Then you don't know what time she got here. No, I don't. It was after the phone calls. He changed the dollar into dimes for me and used the pay for in the lobby for phone calls. You've been a great help, Mr. Galloway. Yeah? That makes me feel fine. Just all right. I helped. Good. Good. Of 
course it's my card, Mr. Clover, and of course I left it there with that man for Lou. How come you visited him there, Miss Douglas? A moment. City looks dismal tonight, doesn't it? Let's drop the blind on it. I hate dismal, Mr. Clover. Let's just get on with it, huh? Why I visited Lou? Yep. Yeah. I was his friend and his wife's friend, her best friend. You know what that means between women? Friend, we tell each other everything. Go on. Last night, her husband phoned me, said he was at some rat trap of a hotel. I couldn't understand half of what he was talking about. Drunk? I guess. When I got there, he was looped, really gone. He phoned you and told you where he was, is that right? And he needed help. I went to him. What he needed was sobering. He was pretty bad. He said he'd killed Janice. He told you that? He said he'd had an argument with her. He said she had lied to him. She'd lied and lied and lied, he said. And he pushed her, and she fell, and she died. Well, I guess that's it. He murdered his wife, then he killed himself. Mostly that's all he kept saying, Mr. Clover. She lied to him, and he killed her. Only... Only what? He didn't really kill her. You know that, don't you? No, no, I don't. Janice had a bad heart. Very bad. What are you... Lou didn't know it. She never told her husband about her heart, Mr. Clover. And? And I did. Last night, I told Lou that Janice's death was an accident. She got excited, and her heart... Well... Tell me something about Lou, Miss Douglas. What do you mean, about Lou? The kind of man he was. A charmer. Spent his father-in-law's money in a charming manner. Made his wife laugh in a charming manner. That makes a charmer, doesn't it? That was Lou, all right, all right. That was Lou. Let's try another look at the city, Mr. Clover. Still stinks. Danny? Yes, you know. You got something for me? Yeah. Report from Detective Mugovan. In routine check on background of the deceased Lou Bennett, he found Mr. Bennett well-liked in his circle of friends. Mm -hmm. Also, when asked about Mr. Bennett's type work, his circle of friends smiled from the sides of their mouth. Oh? Lou Bennett, they said, was not the chap to hold on long to a job. A flitterer, they said. His mood would change, he would flit. And big spaces of unemployment in between. Yeah, anything else? From Dr. Sinsky, medal, medical report on the deceased Lou Bennett which states that his body was unmarked, no signs of violence, that his hanging could hold a suicide. Probably got despondent in his drunkenness and... That's all, Gino? No. Well... From Dr. Sinsky, report also on the deceased Mrs. Bennett, which states that the bruises found about her face and arms were not alone sufficient to cause her death. Oh, fine, thank you, Gino. For a while, consider it. Husband who had been called murderer by a woman's father who had been precise and professional in the examination of her dying, who rose from her and stood and made bitter accusation. So consult a notebook. The quality of light has changed in the room. Twilight now. Swift ebb of day. Turn on the desk lamp. Find an address and a phone number. Call it. Hello? Dr. Nolan? Lieutenant Clover, doctor, I want to come talk to you. About Janice? About my daughter's murder? Yes. I'll wait for you in my office. And go to the office of Dr. Nolan, which was diploma and license and scarred desk. And snapshots of daughter from childhood held in a silver frame hung on a wall to themselves. My daughter was always a beautiful young woman, Mr. Clover. Yes. But not so in death. Her beauty was spoiled. Dr. Nolan... Uh... And her murderer hanged himself, I read. Remorse? Was that his emotion, Mr. Clover? Oh, I don't know. Is there such a thing for killers as remorse? I feel it, and I loved her, and I never lifted a finger to her, and I have wept for her, and I feel it. Remorse. You think her killer, too, felt... Dr. Nolan. Yes? The report from our medical examiner says that the beating she got was not the cause of her death. No, it wasn't. Well, tell me about it. Weeks ago... Weeks ago... The Dr. Nolan... She came to me. She said, Daddy, I haven't been feeling well. 
I enjoy something and suddenly I'm weak and drained, exhausted. Why, Daddy? Why, she said. Well, go on. I examined her. I found the cause. Heart condition? Yes. It was my diagnosis and I advised no overexertion, no sudden... All the usual precautions and she kissed my cheek and made me promise not to tell her husband... Never to mention to her pitiful husband that she might die. You knew this, and still you call him a murderer? Yes. Why? Because he was weak. Because he used everything my daughter had to give him. Her laughter, her gentleness. Accepted it, smiled his thanks on her, used it. And there was little left for anyone else. For you? I hated him. Because he wasn't good enough for my daughter. Because he had beaten her and made her die. Simple as that, Mr. Clover. A murderer. Hmm. Or something else? Yes. Your daughter and her husband lived quite well. Their apartment, their clothes, the expensive things about them. So? I understand your son-in-law never held a job for long. I've already told you the kind of man my daughter married. Still, they lived well, expensively. Did you... Look around you, Mr. Clover. This office. Is it the place of a rich man? And my clothes. The clothes of a rich man? I had nothing to give my daughter. Except the love of lost years and of many heartbreaks and of... I'm sorry her husband hanged himself. He cheated me. Did he? Or did you kill him? No. For that, too, I shall have remorse. Good night, Mr. Clover. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Clover. Good evening, Mr. Folsom. Won't you gentlemen come in? Thanks. This is Detective Mugovan, Mr. Folsom. Hi, Mr. Folsom. Detective Mugovan. Hey, that's you up there in that painting. Real nice. Thank you. Dressed like that, like a... Spanish cavalier from the court of Philip. Yeah, I was just going to say. Real fancy. Thank you. Isn't that real nice, Danny? Yeah. I wish I... Mr. Folsom... Yes? You've heard about Lou Bennett, haven't you? What about him? That he hanged himself. Where did this happen? At the Thomas... Tea bag on 3rd Avenue. Will you gentlemen pardon me? What for? Shh. Thank you. You mind if I ask you what that bit was for, closing your eyes? Congratulating myself, sir. Once I predicted that Lou Bennett would come to a sudden end, I would call the way he died sudden, wouldn't you? Look, mister, when a man dies, no matter who it is, you don't figure out... I'm sorry. You paid for their wedding, didn't you, Mr. Folsom? Genesis and Lou's? Yes, yes, I told you that. Big wedding? Brilliant. Ever tell you about how my wife and I got married, Danny, on our lunch hour down at the city hall? And in those days, we only had a half hour for lunch. Then you had barely time for a snack. Is that what you're trying to tell us? From Phillips Court, huh? Exactly. What else did you do for those two, Mr. Folsom? How do you mean? Well, uh, Lou couldn't hold on to a job. Janice didn't work. Her father didn't make a whole lot of money. Yet Lou and Janice lived like... Like from Phillips Court. You know... You know what I mean, Mr. Folsom. This is known as bandying, gentlemen. Now, what is it you have on your mind? I asked you a question, Mr. Folsom. Yes, you did. Then answer it. Very well. Beside being a lovely girl, Janice was... Persuasive? Persuasive. Thank you very much. So you supported them? You're plucking words from my mouth at a great rate, Mr. Clover. Let's just get with it, huh? Did you give him money or didn't you? Look, Mr. Fulton, there are very simple ways of finding that out. Cancel checks. From time to time, I gave Janice money. And she accepted it. Why not? <laughs> sure. Why not? Shut up. You loved her, Mr. Fulton. What right have you well, to ask? Sure he did. Why shouldn't I give her everything she wanted? See? Sure he did, Danny. Didn't you, Mr. Fulton? Loved her. Loved her. Well? Of course I did. Hey, you're doing that bit again, Mr. Folsom. What are you congratulating yourself for this time? Mr. Folsom? You want to know, don't you? Because you killed Lou Bennett. You want to know, don't you? Listen, Mr. Folsom, we know Bennett was the cause of his wife's death. He thought he'd murdered her. He ran away and hid. Then he did all the things a hysterical man does. He drank, he called everybody he knew. Police, his father-in-law. And you, and she married him. Which made them husband and wife, Mr. Folsom. Yes. He thought he'd murdered her, then he found out he didn't. A woman, a friend of his, Toby Douglas, came to him and told him his wife was a sick woman, that his killing her was accidental. Top thing he could have been tried on would have been manslaughter. Probably just turned out to be an assault and battery rap. Why should he hang himself? 
He didn't have nerve enough to. Did you try to get him to hang himself when you came to that room where he was? He was drunk. He laughed at me. He said he didn't murder Janice. He murdered her as surely as... So you murdered him? He killed her, and the law wouldn't have punished him enough for it. So you did? Quite. It's a panic in neon, this Broadway, where pleasure is a packaged commodity, where bargain prices prevail for the half-hour smile, sometimes on installments. It's the place that dares you, and one way or another, it'll rock you to sleep. It's Broadway, the gaudiest, the most violent, the lonesomest mile in the world. Broadway, my beat. Broadway's My Beat stars Larry Thor as Detective Danny Clover, with Charles Calvert as Tartaglia and Jack Crucian as Mugovan. The program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with musical score composed and conducted by Alexander Courage. In tonight's transcribed story, Edgar Barrier was heard as Emery Folsom, and Herb Butterfield as John Nolan. Featured in the cast were Shep Mankin, High Everback, and Kathy Lewis. Bill Anders speaking. <laughs> Tonight's broadcast concludes this present series of Broadway's My Beat. At this time, Larry Thor, Charles Calvert, and Jack Crucian are stars, Morton Fine and David Friedkin are writers, Elliot Lewis, our producer-director, Alexander Courage, our musical director, and the staff of the program thank all of you for your kind attention. We hope to rejoin you soon. Next week at this time, 21st Precinct. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network. Last Broadway is my beat, the Janice Bennett murder case from 1953. Our second program is a spy adventure, dangerous assignment, and an episode entitled London, The Secret Code from 1951. Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. Yeah, danger is my assignment. I get sent to a lot of places I can't even pronounce. They all spell the same thing, though. Trouble. But when I walk into the commissioner's office, I don't realize that this assignment's going to have me playing a friendly little game of who's who. The only trouble with it is that the guy who loses gets killed. Good morning, Commissioner. Ruth said you had an assignment for me. I do. Steve, suppose you had a secret code. Yeah? And you suddenly found out it wasn't so secret. What? Suppose you found out that a hostile country had succeeded in deciphering it. What would you do? Well, I'd quit using that particular code. Would you? Well, wait a minute. No, I don't. If, if I knew that they'd broken the code, but they didn't know I knew, I think I'd keep on using it. Why? Well, that way I could send a lot of phony information that would probably tie their strategy in knots. That's absolutely right, Steve. And that's just what's been going on for the last six months. What? Yeah, six months ago, we found out from a very secret source that a certain country had broken one of our diplomatic codes. One we've been using with the French government. And we've been using that same code since, sending false information? Yes, we've managed to mislead that particular country on several vital issues during that period. Well, it sounds like a pretty neat little racket. It is indeed, and we'd like to keep it going as long as possible. But obviously, the success of it depends on their not knowing that we know they've broken our code. And that's why the whole thing is hanging in the balance right now. You mean they found out we Not yet. But unless we can prevent it, they're going to find out very soon. How do you mean? Somewhere along the line here in the States, there's been a leak, Steve. Somebody found out our little secret. And right now, as I'm route to a meeting with a representative from that other country to sell them that secret. Oh, great. Who is this guy? And where is he now? We think that uh, he or she's in London at the moment. He or she? Well, Steve, we haven't the slightest idea who this person is. Oh, you're really giving me a lot to go on, Commissioner. Right now, that's all the information we have. Uh, do you know where this meeting is to take place? No. Huh. Uh, you say you think this character is in London. Have we any agents there? Yeah, Slater's in London right now, working on the deal. He's staying at the Regency Hotel. Get over there, Steve. Work with Slater. Try to find out who this person is, and above all, prevent that meeting from taking place. Well, I said, you've got your assignment. Good luck. <laughs> National Broadcasting Company is presenting Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy in the role of Steve Mitchell, colorful, two-fisted government agent. At all those places of the world where danger and intrigue walk hand in hand, there you'll find Steve Mitchell on another Dangerous Assignment. Sure, I've got my assignment. Find somebody, we don't know who, who's on his way to a secret meeting, we don't know where. <laughs> a real breeze. Well, it's Wednesday when I get to London. I head for Slater's hotel room. 
I'm sure glad to see you, Steve. I've been chasing so many smoke rings on this deal for the last few days that I'm groggy. But all of a sudden, things are looking up for us now. What do you mean? An old friend of mine blew into London from Eastern Europe last night. Triplis. Oh, yeah, that little international information peddler, huh? That's right. What I found out from him cost me plenty, but it was worth it. What'd you find out? The meeting is to take place in Athens, Greece, tomorrow night. Athens? Yep. According to his information, our boy's going to be on the plane that takes off in two hours. Oh, Triplis seems to know just about everything else. Does he know who this party is? No, you know how these things go, Steve. You can find out a lot about events in this business, but as to the names of people involved, well, that's a different story. Yeah. Uh, one more thing. Do you have any information on where in Athens the meeting is to take place? No. As I understand it, Steve, the boy who's peddling the secret is to be contacted in Athens by their agent as soon as the plane lands. Presumably, the agent will set up the meeting with him then. I see. Well, I guess I'd better arrange myself space on that plane to Athens. Good work, Slater. See you in Athens. Bye, Steve. <laughs> Shots came from Slater's room. I run back and jerk the door open. Slater's lying on the floor. Window, Steve, window. I head for the open window. There's a fire escape leading down to the alley, but there's nobody in sight. I go back to Slater, but one look and I know he won't be able to tell me who shot him. Slater is dead. So now I'm strictly on my own. The boy we're after was on to Slater, all right. Now I'm asking myself, is he or she on to me, too? I've got an uneasy hunch that sooner or later that question will be answered one way or another. But right now, I know the killer's going to be on that plane to Athens, which means I've got to be on it, too. I cable our agent in Athens, and then I head for the airport outside London and buy my ticket. I've got half an hour until takeoff, so I drop in at the bar just off the waiting room. There's only one other customer at the moment, a girl down at one end of the bar. I slide onto the stool beside her. Hi. Hi. One for the road, huh? Yeah, how about you? Where I'm heading for, I'll need more than one. Oh, where's that? I got a job waiting for me in Arabia. Secretary to the boss of an oil company there. But you know, little Marty's having a tough time telling yourself into taking it. Yeah, that's pretty rugged country. Yeah. So I'm keeping my eyes open. And if I find anything more interesting along the way, I'll take it. You mean a job? Well, that's not limited. <laughs> well, now you've heard the story of my life. What's yours? Oh, just knocking around, heading for Athens in about 20 minutes. Oh, good. Huh? We'll be plane mates. What? Look, I thought you said you were going to Arabia. Sure. By way of Athens. I see. A little out of your way, isn't it? Maybe. But I'm in no hurry. Like I told you, if I run into anything more interesting on the way, well... <laughs> yeah. Well, who knows, Marge? Maybe you will. I'll see you on the plane. <laughs> later, the plane takes off. I get a passenger list from the store and start checking off the names and the faces in my mind. Quite a few of them I can eliminate right off the bat. Some British Army and Navy officers, a Senate committee. Finally, my list narrows down to four passengers. Marjorie, the girl who's looking for something interesting, a tall, sinister-looking gent named Stryker who's sitting next to her, a nervous little Frenchman named LeBlanc, and a fat gent named Fabian who's sitting next to me. Fabian's the happy tourist type, and his supply of bum <laughs> jokes is apparently inexhaustible. <laughs> then he says, why, that's nothing. I can't even find the room. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's pretty good, huh? Well, that reminds me of the one about the fellow who what decided that... Uh, that, uh... <laughs> yeah. Yeah, how do you like that? Won't even let me start it. Now, that's the trouble with these foreigners, you know. No sense of humor at all. You know what I mean? Well, I wouldn't exactly say that. Now, you, you're different. You're a fellow American. You know what I mean? I guess so. I mean, you got a sense of humor. Now, this joke I was about to uh, tell... Yeah, yeah, it's... you've got quite a stock of them, haven't you? <laughs> Listen, when you're a traveling salesman, it isn't long before you find out just how important jokes are. You know what I mean? I mean, when it comes right down to it, you're not selling your product, you're selling yourself. Well, in your case, I bet you must be quite a salesman. Well, no, that, that's mighty nice of you. Uh, I'm not sure I get you, friend. Oh, skip it. What else do you sell besides yourself and your snappy sense of humor, Fabian? Oh, the right fountain pen, friend. Surely you've heard of us and our slogan. Slogan? Yeah. Right, right, right. Oh, fine. <laughs> and that, of course, reminds me of the story about the woman who used one of our pens. Uh, aren't we turning off our courts? Yeah. Uh, I wonder why. We're over the south of France right now, and it's fogging up on us quite a bit. We'll probably be down for a few hours. Well, well that suits me all right. I can sell as many pens in the south of France as I can anywhere else. I can. I can see one guy who doesn't seem to suit. Huh? A hey, tall gent sitting next to the girl. He seems to be doing a little fancy fidgeting. Uh, I say, I didn't notice before. Uh, 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 the little lady, she, she's quite a looker, isn't she? You mean Marjorie? Uh, oh, you know her? Uh-huh. Hey, you, uh, you think I could make any time there? Well, she said she was looking for something interesting. <laughs> well, in that case, we ought to get along just fine together. Because if there's one thing I am, it's interesting. You know what I mean? Uh, no, but keep me in the dark. Know what I mean? The plane lands at a little emergency airfield. Nearby, there's a French village. All of the passengers troop in and head for the nearest bar. Hi, Steve. How you doing? Hi. Okay, Marjorie. You know, I've got a guy who's just dying to meet you. His name is Fabian. Oh? Well, I hope he's more interesting than the tall gent who's been sitting next to me. His name's Stryker. But I had to practically beat that fact right out of him. Yeah, I don't think he said more than six words all the way. I noticed he didn't seem too happy when the steward told us we were going to land here. Yeah, I noticed that, too. How about a drink? Oh, sure. It sounds that fresh enough. I'll see you a little later. Okay. Oh, my apologies, Monsieur Mitchell. I didn't see you behind me. Something you wanted, Lubeck? Well, well no, I, I was merely passing by you when you turned around. Funny, you were awfully quiet about it. What do you mean? 
Also funny that you should know my name. No more so than you should know mine, monsieur. Huh. Yeah, I guess that makes us even one way or another. I'm out of drink. Uh, merci, but uh, I prefer not. The blank scurries outside. Fabian over at the bar gives me a big grin and waves me over, but I've had enough of his know-what-I-mean and lousy jokes to last me for the rest of the trip. After a while, I get tired of waiting for Marjorie and inhaling all that smoky air, so I go outside. The fog is swirling thickly around the place. I start walking, trying to fit together what I know so far, which isn't much. LeBlanc the Frenchman, Stryker the tall, silent guy, Fabian the jokester, and Marjorie. It could be any of them, or it could be none of them. Yeah, right now I'm beginning to wonder if I've taken the wrong plane. Then I hear it. Just a little sound, but enough to tell me I'm not on the wrong trail. After all, the sound of a gun being cocked somewhere in the fog. I hit the ground fast. The slugs fan past me. I scramble to my feet and take off in the direction I think they came from. Suddenly, I'm wallowing around in a muddy field. I can hear somebody else running, but in the fog, I can't tell where. The mud gets gooier, but I keep going. Suddenly, a hand shoots out and grabs my ankle. I spread eagle in the air. Too late, I see the rock on the ground under my head. I make a perfect three-point landing. <laughs> You are listening to Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell. I don't know how long I've been out, but when I come to, I'm all alone in the muddy field, so now it looks like whoever I'm after knows a lot more about me than I know about him. But what I don't get is this. Why didn't he finish me off? I head back to the bar, but all the other passengers are gone. I find out from the bartender they've gone back to the airport. So I get there on the double. The plane's up at the end of the runway, all set for the takeoff. I make it aboard just in time. to think you missed the plane. Yeah, looks like somebody was trying to arrange for me to miss the plane, Marjorie. What do you mean? Oh, skip it. That's all, my friend. I hope you don't mind if I desert you for a while. Well, I'll try to be brave about it. I thought it was high time that this little lady and I got acquainted. You know what I mean? So I talked that guy Stryker into changing seats with me for the rest of the trip. Okay, see you later. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I see you didn't miss the plane, LeBlanc. I? But why should I, Monsieur Mitchell? Well, that's a good question. Excuse me. I uh, said excuse me. Hmm? Oh, sorry. A bit wrapped up in my book, I guess. You mind if I squeeze by you? This is my seat next to the window. Oh, quite. Thank you. You're a striker, aren't you? Hmm? Oh, yes. Mine's Mitchell. Really? Fabian said he'd uh, talked you into trading seats with him. Hmm? I say, old boy, if you don't mind, I am trying to read. Sure, not a bad idea. Let's see, I think I left my newspaper here on the floor. Yeah. There it is. Uh-oh. What stopped me cold is Stryker's shoe beside the newspaper on the floor. There's mud on it, and it's the same color of mud as that in the field where I was chasing the person who shot at me. So, Stryker, at this point, has just been promoted to number one on my suspect list. It's a long haul to Athens, but I don't close my eyes for a second all the way. Sitting next to a guy you think could be a killer is not exactly conducive to snoozing. Finally, the plane lands in Athens. I get off first and hurry into the waiting room. According to what Slater had found out before he was killed, this is the spot where the contact is to be made. I look around the waiting room. Several people are lounging around, two guys over in one corner, a third standing in front of a poster, a woman with a baby. Any one of them could be the agent. Now the rest of the passengers file into the waiting room. Marjorie's first. She doesn't talk to a soul, but heads straight for the newsstand, picks out a magazine and starts looking at it. Next comes Fabian, the fat boy. He walks straight through the waiting room and into the limousine outside. Stryker follows him directly to the limousine. Then comes LeBlanc, but he stops in the waiting room and talks to one of the men there. The gent turns and leaves. LeBlanc starts out the door. I catch up with him outside. Let go of me, Mitchell. So you're my boy, LeBlanc. I said let go of me. What? Well, complete with gun, huh? Oui, complete with gun. And now to keep you in order, my friend. Handcuffs? Hey, what is this, anyway? Since you seem to be aware of my identity and attempted just now to detain me forcibly, it follows that you are undoubtedly a criminal, wanted in one country or another. Now I will investigate and... Criminal wanted? Hey, look, who are you? Inspector Leblanc of the French Sûreté. Oh, great, and here I've been thinking that... Now, maybe... monsieur, perhaps you will be good enough to identify yourself. Well, my credentials are in my pocket, but it looks like you'll have to fish them out yourself. These handcuffs are a little confining. Very well. Ah, please? Yeah, that's it. What? Agent from the United States. That's right. Looks like we've sort of been working at cross purposes, doesn't it? Now, would you mind on handcuffing me, LeBlanc? Oh, but of course. You know I feel somewhat embarrassed, Monsieur Mitchell. Oh, that's okay. I guess I did look a little suspicious, do you? Oui, and then when I learned of the attempt on your life in that muddy field in the south of France... Hey, wait a minute. You saw someone shooting at me? No, no. I was outside walking around when I heard the shots. I saw you run across the field in pursuit, then I heard you fall. Ah, that explains why I wasn't killed then. The killer must have heard you and took off. Mitchell, it is obvious that we are working on the same assignment. A code proposition. Oui. Yeah, well, according to our information, LeBlanc, whoever is out to sell the secret was on that plane. He or she was to be contacted at the airport waiting room. Oui. 
Now, with you off my suspect list, that narrows it down to three people, Stryker, Fabian, and Marjorie. But none of these three people spoke to a single person in the waiting room. I know it. That's what bothers me. Incidentally, who was that guy I saw you talking to, LeBlanc? Oh, that was one of my men, Mitchell. I had ordered him to try and discover who was to contact one of the passengers, but he was unable to do so. Eh, I don't get it. None of them did talk to anyone. They got in the limousine and... Mitchell. What's the matter? The limousine. While we stand here talking, we have let them slip right through our fingers. You mean the contact might be made in the limousine? Oh, at some other point. Any one of them could have the driver drop them off at the meeting place. Well, a matter of fact, I sort of hope that's what happened, LeBlanc. Makes things easier for us that way. Easier for us? Are you insane, Mitchell? Not more than usual. Come on, let's go to the hotel, LeBlanc. I'll show you what I mean. Oh, Mitchell, I still do not understand what you mean by... Oh, no, wait, wait. That man sitting over there in the center of the lobby, is he not the driver of the limousine? Looks like him. Come on. Eh, uh, I beg your pardon, monsieur. Hi, Steve. Bill? Uh, Steve, Bill, uh, do you know each other? Sure. <laughs> this is Bill Donner. He's an agent of ours, LeBlanc. What? But uh, how did you arrange for him? I to... cabled him before I left London. Told him to be at the airport here in Athens when the plane landed. I figured the logical thing for me to do was drive the limousine. Oh, I see. Anything of interest happened on that trip from the airport here to the hotel? Nothing, Steve, but really nothing. Mm. All three of them come to this hotel? No, Stryker wanted off at another hotel a few blocks away. Mitchell, perhaps that is where the meeting is to be. Hey, don't worry. I asked for the cooperation of the Athens police. They've got a boy over there keeping an eye on Stryker. As for the girl and the fat boy, uh, what's his name? Fabian. Yeah, Fabian. We've got their rooms watched. Nobody's been to see them, nobody's called them on the telephone, and they haven't tried to make any calls or contacts either. Ah, eh, well, good work, Bill, but that's the trouble. It's almost too good. What do you mean? We've got all three of them bottled up tight. Maybe the contact's already been made. Well, there sure wasn't any contact made after they left the airport waiting room, that's for sure. And Mitchell, mm -hmm. how could any contact have been made inside the waiting room? We observed all three of them. They did not talk to a soul. The two men went directly to the limousine. The young lady paused only long enough to glance at the magazine at the newsstand. Hold on a minute, wait a minute. Magazine, newsstand. Hey. Steve, you think she could have gotten a message out of the magazine she was looking at? I don't know. They'd really have to be sure she got the right magazine, but what I'm beginning to wonder is if the contact might not have been a visual one. Visual? No. I, I don't follow you, Mitchell. Well, something in that waiting room that would give whoever was looking for it a clue to, as to the meeting place. But what could it be? I don't know, maybe nothing, but it's worth a chance anyway. I'll see you later. <laughs> I head back to the airport waiting room. At this point, I don't even know what I'm looking for, but I start walking around. The newsstand is piled high with various assorted magazines and newspapers, and if the clue to the meeting place is somewhere in the stack, it's a cinch, I'll never find it, then I notice some posters around the walls. Most of them are in Greek, so I motion to one of the porters. He comes over. You uh, speak English? Like a citizen. Good. How about doing a little translating for me? Translating? Sure. What's to translate? That poster there on the wall, what does it say? This movie poster, my favorite. Huh? Bing Crosby, picture his name of Birth of Blues. Birth of the Blues, brother, that's a real old one. Oh, frequently, we do not get picture here until 15 years after they are made. Yeah, we well, got the same system in the States, only over there they call it television. Well, I guess there's nothing in that poster that'll help me. This picture, name of Birth of Blues, have you seen it? Oh, yeah, quite a few times over the years. He's quite a huge favorite of mine also. Like especially man who has small part of trumpet player, actor name of uh, Brownie Don. Lefit. That's an interesting pronunciation. Do you ever hear of him? I think he was a child actor in those days. Let's see. How about that poster over there? Let me see. Oh, that is about United Nations Children's Fund, organization to help underprivileged children of all countries. Money is requested. Well, that sounds like a worthwhile cause, mm -hmm. but I don't think that'll help me either. Matter of fact, I'm beginning to think I'm barking up the wrong tree. Whoever I'm after probably can't understand Greek either, so how could he get a message from any of these posters? Well, there's for your trouble, Buster. Oh, sure, thanks. You got any more trouble I could get into at these prices? I'm afraid not. Okay. Hey, just a minute. Uh, something else is troubling, I hope? Yeah. That poster behind you, it's in English. Uh, so for this, you need translation, too? No, no, I can read it all right. Wilson conducted tours of Athens. Bus leaves at 12 each day, returns at 6 each night. Tour includes the Acropolis and other ruins, waterfront, tickets, eight. So if it is tour of city you want, I can give you better one than that. Show you places that you would be. No, 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 never mind, thanks. Well, I guess that poster's no help either. It's just that for a moment there was something familiar about it, something that reminded me of... Oh, I don't know what. Maybe you got date to go sightseeing. No, no, well, never mind. Okay. Hey, hold it. So, make up your mind. I think I just did. Huh? 
Yeah, I remember now. When I got off the train and came in here, there was a man standing in front of this sightseeing poster. Just where you are now. So? So he was blocking out part of the poster with his body, and what was left was here. Here, move over just a little. Sure, sure. There, that's it. Now I'll read the part of the poster that's still in sight. Twelve, night, waterfront, eight. Well, what do you know? This is something of interest. It sure is, Porter. It's the most interesting thing I've seen since I left home. Night, waterfront, eight. That's it, LeBlanc. And when freely translated, it means Pier 8 at midnight in my book. Hmm. But if you are right, Mitchell, if this is the contact message, then the person for whom it was intended would not need to stop in the waiting home or talk to a soul. Which means it's open season on all the suspects again. Where are they now? Uh, Fabien is drinking alone in the bar. The girl is up in her room. And Stryker is over at the other hotel under the surveillance of your man, uh, Bill uh, Donner. Let's see, it's a quarter after 11. If that message off the poster is the real McCoy, whoever it was intended for will be leaving for the waterfront before long. Mitchell, look. Coming down the stairs. Hmm? Yeah, Marjorie, heading for the bar. I think I'll join her. Very well. I'll remain here in the lobby. Then. Hi, Marjorie. Drop dead, will you? <laughs> well, sounds like I just lost a fan. What's the trouble? You sick like jerk Fabian onto me, and then you ask me what's the trouble? Oh, I didn't hit it off so well together, huh? Only one thing I'd like to hit off with him. What's that? His head. <laughs> Come on, I'll buy you a drink. Well... <laughs> Oh, that's the best news I've had all day. Marjorie! Mitchell! Over here! Over here! Oh, Grace. <laughs> what are you, Fabian's agent? Not exactly. Come on, one drink with him won't kill you. You want a bet? <laughs> now, this is just fine. I was hoping a friendly face would come along and have a drink with me. <laughs> Heard any more jokes lately, Fabian? I... Ouch! So sorry, Steve. My foot must have just bumped into your shin. Ah, yeah. <laughs> well, how about a nice drink for all of us? Then we'll get around to the jokes. I've still got a million of them that you haven't heard. I doubt that very much. <laughs> yeah, what? Skip it. What time is it, Steve? 11.25. Why? I was just thinking. It's that time I turned in. I think I'll just skip this drink. Oh, sort of sleepy all of a sudden, huh? Yeah. Well, maybe, uh... What's the matter, Steve? Uh, nothing. I'll see you kids later. But right now, something is the matter. Standing there in the bar, I can see out into the lobby. And I suddenly notice that the chair out there is empty. It's the chair LeBlanc was sitting in. I go out into the lobby, but he's nowhere in sight. The clerk tells me he won't went out just a minute ago. Suddenly, I get a wild idea. I head to the pier right at the waterfront. It's a few minutes before midnight when I get there, and out near the end of the pier, I see a cigarette glowing in the dark. Probably the foreign agent with a fist full of dough waiting to buy the information about the code. I slip into the shadows and wait. A couple of minutes later, I hear it. Steps on the pier coming my way. This could be the person I've been after at last. Then I see a figure looming up out of the dark. I wait until it's right beside me. Then I jump. LeBlanc. <coughs> Michel. So that wild idea wasn't so wild after all. What huh? are you talking about? You mostly. I suddenly noticed that you'd left the hotel and it occurred to me you might be my boy. What? Michel, that is absurd. I had a perfectly good reason for leaving the hotel in a hurry. Oh, what was it? Your man Donner sent word from the other hotel that our suspect there, the man called Stryker, was checking out. I proceeded over there immediately and followed Stryker to the airport. But when he boarded a plane for the Far East, I realized that he could not be a man, since he had as yet made contact with no one. I see. I returned to the hotel, but you were gone. Then I remembered the message on the poster you had told me about, so I proceeded here. Oh, you're sorry. It sounds all right, LeBlanc. But of course, because it is true. Oh, no, no, Mitchell, do not let your imagination play tricks on you. I'm trying not to, LeBlanc. I... What is it? Hold it. Yeah. Somebody else coming get down behind these crates. There. Wait. The steps stopped. They must have heard us. Wait. Well, get back. Get back. You okay? Oui. Michel, where did those shots come from? The foreign agent. Farther out on the pier. He must think the first shot was aimed at... That's our boy again. You know, the blank, this is working out just fine. With luck, they may kill each other off. Hey, sounds like the agent got hit. Listen. Yeah, I'll wait until he gets close. Now! Fabian! Let go! Drop the gun! Drop it! I will kill you! I've got your wrist lock. Pull that trigger now and you'll... Michel, he shot himself. Yeah. Trying to do likewise to me. Are you alive? Yeah, yeah. So Fabian the jokester was our boy. Hmm. Looks like in the long run the joke was on him, but at least he turned out to be a very obliging guy. Obliging? Sure. He killed the goose who was going to lay him the golden egg, and then he killed himself. Come on. I want to take a look at this other guy. Well, Mitchell, it appears our secret is still safe. Yep. Both seller and purchaser are the same. are out of business. Now, well, here we are. Shine your light down on the pier. Very well. Ah. Ah, oui, I recognize him. He's a well-known foreign agent. You mean wise? Yeah, I've seen his picture before. Wait a minute. This envelope in his hand. 
Hey, pretty bulky. Damn, Michelle. Mm -hmm. American money. The envelope is bulging with it. Thousand dollar bills. Fifteen of them. They really must have figured the Tavian secret was worth plenty, all right. Um, at a time like this, it, it would be convenient to be soldiers of fortune rather than government agents, Michelle. Yeah, it'd be a tiny little sum to slip into our pockets, wouldn't it? But I've got a much better idea, LeBlanc. A poster I saw in the airport. Poster? Oh, you mean the one of which you had the message about this meeting place? Oh, no, another one. Advertising the United Nations Children's Fund, an organization to feed and clothe underprivileged and displaced children. According to the poster, they need dough, and here's 15,000 bucks. <laughs> no, that is a splendid idea, Mitchell. You know, I am certain that this dead agent's government could have no possible objection if this money were used for such a noble purpose. Well, after all, the blank, they're always yapping about how interested they are in the little people. So we're just taking them at their word. <laughs> Dangerous Assignment, starring Brian Donlevy as Steve Mitchell, is written by Bob Reif and Adrian Jondo, with music by Robert Armbruster, and is produced and directed by Bill Kind. Be with us again next week at this same time, when Brian Donlevy, starring in the role of Steve Mitchell, will embark on another Dangerous Assignment. Dangerous Assignment came to you from Hollywood. Theater Guild on the Air brings you Hamlet tomorrow on NBC. That's it for this week. We'll be back next week with more old-time radio. I hope you can join us then. Till then, this is Jim Dolan thanking you for listening. The RTC Weekly Download is produced by Chris Stone and Jim Dolan. <laughs>